And I have something I'm going to read, so bear with me for reading it, for not being so spontaneous. As an artist interested in art and science, I'm concerned about conducting and wrestling with questions of form, meaning color, cinematic composition, depth of field, sound, as well as content, meaning subject, subliminal levels of meaning, politics, transcendence, cultural distinction. Art has a particular opportunity to play a role that is distinct from the rationality of design and is provocative in light of the coming disaster of climate change and sea level rise. I'll show some examples of this work later. So that's what I'm talking about is aesthetics and adaptation and sea level rise. In the postmodern era, which continues to hang on the coattails of modernity, we process culture both as tradition and as errant. We hunger for originality and conversely the reverent familiar. In the West, we try to picture ourselves in relationship to nature, yet distinct from it. We try to touch nature and we try to withdraw. Mistakenly, we assume that we are either at the center of nature or apart from it, with a footprint, in, a footprint intrinsically large. We camp from our cars, our campers with electrical hookup, or from safety of our cabins or mountain townhouses in the midst of ski runs. We want to see the stars and yet we romanticize their distance. We long for the picturesque always out of reach and yet in our view. The view is a commodity and emblematic of success. This urge is so strong that if we aren't, if, if we aren't near real picturesque nature, then we make it, we manufacture it. We manufacture the illusion without skipping a beat. There are countless examples of this, both small and monumental. One particular one to keep in mind is the city of Las Vegas, in which I am currently making a project. The problems of urban life gave rise to suburbia, which became an escalated challenge for the environment. The suburban lawn, the untenable entity, whole towns were surrounded by water-greedy lawns laid waste to precious resources of water. These relatively new dwelling clusters were predicated on economic, aesthetic, and cultural decisions. The rising middle class wanted to separate from the messy picture of poverty so familiar in urban areas. We had no thought of what this might mean to resources, nor transportation costs. Where would our jobs be? It just removed the image of certain urban problems. The diffused social ills were compartmentalized for easy digestion. These are the paintings of Robert Bechtel. Bechtel's paintings seamlessly fit here into the genre of living spaces, and perhaps if we spent enough time with them, we would find the nuances of contradiction. They're quite tenderly painted, very expert. He has a solo exhibition currently on, on view in New York. This is another one. This is San Francisco. In climate change and sea level rise, what might dwellings look like? What will the neighborhoods look like? The designer is the image maker here, whether professional or vernacular. Some famous examples include those who have adapted to waterborne life because of their geographic location. I don't imagine that this decision to make a floating garden is entirely based on practical solutions. It is also a cultural decision. The first example I want to mention is Aztec civilization, known to us through art and fragments of their agrarian existence. Today, so Lake Xochimilco in Mexico is a favorite location for travelers to ride in romantic trajineras, these. The agricultural gestures of floating gardens have remained as trace elements of the former Grand Lake, now Mexico City. Hydrophonics have been a popular way of gardening and farming in many cities around the world. Here are contemporary examples of floating farms, this one in Myanmar, another in London. This is called Chug, a floating traditional boat community on the Thames River in London that maintains gardens, duck boats, beekeeping, bird breeding, urban floating, and all kinds of gardens, including livestock on boats. This is another example of Chug. Chug also has some small little floating things. This is a bird nest in Chug. This is a coon. And there are cultural festivals in Chug. This is Carnival in Chug. 
as well as inspiration for Maxwell Creeley's work here, too, also on the Thames. It's important to look around the globe for floating projects for inspiration. Watching the creative expression of these and also a civil society gives examples such as in Vietnam. In contrast to this, I read this week about the first McDonald's opening in Ho Chi Minh City. The vibrancy of the painted structures are full of joy, despite their fragility. This South Korean floating house interior is in stark contrast to the Southeast Asian example in terms of resources. Mashpomel is a town in the Netherlands that has a handle on how to create floating adapted homes for the middle class. Netherlands have long had to deal with this rise of sea level. The decisions are no more urgent than for the Vietnamese. Color here is upbeat, responding to utopian desire and nature's kaleidoscope. Design has a different function than art. It captures practicality, synthesis, visual pleasure. Art is different. Not that it does not overlap, but it can. This is another leisure time example in Bashkoma. Art is ungovernable. Art brings more questions to the mix. Both, both can point to science and politics and social concerns. This is British artist Jason de Carres and Taylor, and this is Underwater Sculpture Garden in Cancun. His audience are those who feel comfortable in scuba diving and snorkeling along the relatively shallow bottom of the continental shelf. He made cement sculptures and sided them on the ocean floor, and then seeded them with corals in an effort to establish a new coral zone. The figures are examples of contemporary time and everyday life. His work began installation, what started installation, it's been an ongoing long-term project, during United Nations COP16, the Conference of the Parties on Climate Change in hopes of gathering attention of the efficacy of art in the global dilemma. Mm -hmm. Consider the problems of our beloved travel. Masses of tourists travel in giant ships. And this is, I understand this is one of the more extreme examples, but certainly um, I'm implicating myself in the desire for travel. The cruise industry that mirrors small cities where everything, is want everything wanted is contained on a boat. Waste is flushed into the sea, and each passenger willingly blind to this fact. The larger and larger cruise ship continues to be another surreal example of how humans might adapt to climate change. Would this be positive or negative if many of us lived on these ships? I wonder if it would become a necessity, some lesser dark of two evils. There was a particularly disturbing case of a cruise ship actually ignoring the, distre the distress calls from three fishermen in the middle of the ocean when two fishermen died, one 16 and one 24. The star princess was too busy with vacationing tourists to bother to help. We, as witnesses, are left to decipher the consequences. We snap pictures as keepsakes of nature memories. We are fascinated by the terror and the beauty of the ocean its vastness, its blue, its green, its reflection of the sun, the sea mammals in their habitat. We wonder if the sea's ability to swallow us, will it be sublime? Here I have a couple of paintings that I made um, trying to implicate my own participation in, in the demise of the earth. Art has the potential to move people in more ways than one. I myself have this series, The Grand Tour, Making paintings that deal with the problems of travel implicate my own desire, and like touching the stalactites too many times in a cave, the natural forms turn black. Here are two painting examples of this, where loving the place creates much of its detriment. One is Kyoto, which is, an, which is important for a couple of reasons, revering culturally Kyoto's um, contribution to thought and meditation and um, history of Shinto and Buddhism, but also it is the site of the only world agreement where flawed, however flawed, to protect the environment. The, 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 the next image is Niagara Falls, in which the government spends, the local or, I'm not sure, local, federal, spends hundreds of thousands of dollars filling in the falls with cement to stabilize its erosion and to shine a spectrum of colored lights onto the fall at night. The public has accepted this spectacle as their Niagara, 
it is to heighten nature's experience when you see these colors. This is the picture that caused me to pause one time among many, or maybe the first time in a long time. The picture was both art and it was a message to the world. It was a message to civil society. How might it have to be? How governments might have to image themselves? This is Mohammed Rashid of the Maldives when he was president signing documents. And this is the Maldivian flag. Flags are images that I am concerned with today. The concept of the nation state being up for grabs is certainly the consequence of Hurricane Katrina. How could the richest, most advanced nation on the planet manage to fail its citizens? What will be the efficacy of nation states into the future? <coughs> and how do we think of this? As, and as, as aesthetics is evidence of both human, of both individual and societal development, therefore in the moment of tangible human failure, such as war, the practice of creating images continues to be omnipresent. I certainly remember the cellist of Sarajevo, Vedran Smolovic, and all others who played the cello at exactly the same time around the world as the bombing began. This, the next image, let's see. Okay. This is a piano player um, this past week from the Ukraine playing a piano with the colors painted of the EU. More images coupled with the intervention of art, music, and culture provides a look of how climate aesthetics might be located. This current global dilemma, of course, will result in conflict, not to mention war. When speaking of the destruction of the planet, the specter is so dark, so large, so minimal, so silent, so loud, so beautiful in its completeness. It's also so ugly in detail that we cannot expect aesthetics to be absent. We need it. What we don't want to picture is the magnitude of death, the loss of the natural world as we know it, our beloved natural beauty, our beloved hometown, our revered cabin in the woods, the quietness of the edge of civilization, a ghost ship of civil society moving slowly towards the end of the newly flattened earth. Once the earth was round, and now it is metaphorically flat again. And I'm going to... Do we have the sound? This is a training film. This is Jose Navarrete and Debbie Kazajima. They're dancers. This is a really short piece of a really a much longer film. and lay 
labor is vain. The God of plague and fire raised like the sensible lightning from my sea. And all the house of animals to say this, all empty and all dark. Yes, the sun that is upon the desert of the sea. Therefore, O oh mighty people, we turn to you. Find us our safety. Find us a remedy. Whether by counsel of the gods or of the people of wisdom tested in the past and after the time of troubles and after other, noblest among us restore life to our city. Think how all of us call you the liberator from the triumph long ago. Ah, when your years of wisdom are remembered, let them not say you rose but later fell. Keep the state from going down in the and I went there to teach them certain things, some kind of practical skills in video and sound, and then they, they all in turn became actors in the film. athletes, I recognize that sports are crucial for, by, for a civil society, and that if we have sports, we have a chance to be good to each other. Sport is a replica of leisure time. It's aside from the shortest route to production. Short is a divergence and a confluence. I mean, sport is a divergence and a confluence on how to channel our feelings of competition, the lure of individual power and team greatness. Sport is sexual. Sport is a common language among all cultures of the continents. As in music, music is a language that highlights difference and becomes commonplace for human interaction. Art is similar to sport, and it's crucial, though we might not admit it. The contradiction of art is also culture and, 
and distant from it at the same time. Art is of the masses and of the elites, art is for the heroes and for the villains, for the victims and the perpetrators, and art can be at odds with democracy or it can be with it. <laughs>